I'd like to introduce our featured speaker. Uh, he has had his work appear in over 60 peer-reviewed publications. Uh, he's a professor for the Department of Neurobiology and Behavior at the University of California, Irvine, uh, Lord of Winterfell, Warden of the North, CEO of Stark Enterprises. I would like to introduce Dr. Craig Stark. Thank you. Well, thank you uh, for the invitation and uh, for getting a chance to come on out and talk to you again. And I'd also really like to thank Matt for basically giving the comedic version of, of my talk ahead of time here. Um, so hopefully you'll have a chance of actually at least remembering the take, -home, uh, the take home from it there. So last year when I was out here, I was talking about memory distortions, how your memory really can't always be trusted. And I'm going to be talking about memory again today, but I'm going to be talking about remembering information, and also importantly about forgetting information. So if I were to ask you right now to think back, way, way back in your life to yesterday, can you remember what you did? I mean, besides the mundane things, that I got up, I had breakfast, I brushed my teeth, or hopefully at least you brushed your teeth. Um, hopefully we can remember these kinds of things. But as we start to go back further and further in time, our, our memory gets a little bit more fuzzy. So right now, it's the 13th of March, 2016. I had to check this morning to make sure I was on it. But yes, that, that is the date today. And if you could think back right now to what the 13th of March in 2012, what was happening? Can you remember any big events of that day of your life or other events in the world? Anyone? Yeah, probably not. I mean, that's years and years ago. And I mean, a big event like the fact that the age of the print encyclopedia officially died that day because that's when the Encyclopedia Britannica stopped. Okay, we thought about it at the time, but it's gone. We can make it a little bit easier and say, okay, how about move up a year, March 13th, 2013? A whole year ahead. And yet still, most of us are like, Dah, I don't know. All right, well, that's the day that Pope Francis was actually elected. Figured perfect topic for the audience here today. Because all of you have to stand out, I'm sure. Um, this is years ago, and come on, we don't do that kind of thing, but let's just even go back just a couple months. So January 13th, 2016. Anything? Come on, it's two months. Nothing? No, like, 1.5 billion reasons why you should remember that? Uh, that was the Powerball. And even somebody in Chino Hills won a third of that. And by the way, no, he did not die from hookers and blow. I heard that. It's a total myth that the, part, the weekend afterwards, it was hookers and blow. He killed himself. No, that, that was a myth. OK, so but this tells us something about memory. It tells us, as this picture shows, that our memories fade with time. They decay. The information just goes. And when I tell people that I study memory, Pretty much the universal reaction is something like, oh, you should study my memory. I forget everything. It's horrible. And yes, they all talk like that. I'm not sure why. <laughs> but the idea is that if we had a better memory, we, we would be able to hold on to information better so that things like, oh, you know, the name of that person would spring to mind instantly when you saw them again. You would never, ever actually forget where it is that you put this and had your like, spouse have to do the find my phone to actually go and actually retrieve it. We would be able to hold on to this information. We would be able to use our past more adaptively because we would remember our mistakes, we would remember our successes, and we would be able to go and do this. And it seems like a great thing that a lot of us would actually want to have. But the point is that there's actually a double edge to all of this. And that's the point that Matt was actually making. That forgetting can actually be a powerful kind of thing as well. But most of us don't think about that. We think about how great it would be to have this kind of memory. And there are people out there who have this memory. We've been studying them in our group, and we call them people with highly superior autobiographical memory. And they pass this quiz with flying colors. Let me just give you a little sample as to what these folks are actually like. A 7.1 earthquake hits the San Francisco Oakland area on Thursday. 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 Thursday.
October 19, 1987. It's a Monday. Uh, that was the day the big stock market crash and the cellist Jacqueline Dupre died that time. The Berlin Wall falls on what day? Um, November 9, 1989, which was a Thursday. Christopher Reeve's accident occurred on what day? Uh, it was Saturday, May 27, uh, 1995. And when were the Oscars held in 1999? In 1999. Sunday, March 21st. Yes. Perfect. All right, so you can see this is just effortless. Louise Owen here, it just pops into her mind. And so to study these kinds of people, we've come up with these questions like this to try to see who it is, because it's a rare sort of phenomenon that somebody actually has this. And we have a lot of people who call in after they see things like this 60 Minutes and profess to actually have it. And when we give questions like this, well, if I were right now just to get all of you to actually do this, we would see that there's a, a distribution. Some of us are better, some of us are worse. I'm, I'm down in here. But most of us can get about 15% or so on that. We would see a normal sort of distribution like this. This is what data like this always looks like. And when these people call in and we start interviewing them, these people with this highly superior autobiographical memory, that's where they are. They are literally off the charts. They do so much better than the rest of us that we can say that this is a, a unique or a very, very different, a very special kind of phenomenon. One of the fun things about having done this study here is that I, I asked my graduate student if we actually had a nice sort of, let, let me see all of the data here, and I did want to actually share that with you because it's not that they're completely separate. In fact, the people who call us in, you can see that there are these two sort of peaks. This group up here, and we only really study the top half of them to make sure we're getting the, the sort of best of this. But there are also tons and tons of people who call us in who look indistinguishable from all the rest of us, yet still call in and say, look, I have a great memory. Would you please study me? But it gets even worse than that. I, I pointed to where I am. I'm going to be down in here. I will have you note that one of the biggest bars of the people who call us in are people get 0% correct on this, and yet they profess to have one of the world's best memories. There is something odd with them. It's something different, though, and that's another talk. Okay, and it's not that they're making this kind of thing up. I mean, obviously, on the like, actual facts and events, we can go back and we can check and see when things happen. But even when it's just events in their lives, often we can go and check, either through diaries or other public record kinds of things. We can see, and yes, even when we verify these things, they're not making it up. They are outstanding on this kind of information. So the question that we then have, you know, is, is this something that is just all throughout their memory? And the answer is no. These people are in exceptionally good at remembering the events of their lives, what we call autobiographical memory. Your successes, your failures, the, the events of the day. But if you do something like give them a list of 20 words and ask them about it later, no better than the rest of us. Hold on to this phone number in your head and while you try to write it down, no better than the rest of us. Whole host of kinds of other sorts of everyday memory they look just like us. Where they are off the charts is this memory for the events of their lives. So in terms of making every moment kind of count, they certainly remember those moments. But what's really interesting also about them is that they don't actually get more moments. It's not like the world is some technicolor kind of thing for them. It's that they hold on to the information a lot more. Because if I ask them what they did yesterday or the day before or anything really in the last week, they look just like us. For the last week, they look just like us. But the thing is that their memory for yesterday is really the same as their memory for a month ago. Whereas we are falling off rapidly and we are forgetting all sorts of information, you see that they've forgotten a little bit, but then they hold on to that. Right, we've tested all the way out at 10 years, they're holding on to this. And as I say, it's the events of their lives. Let me give you a demonstration of that aspect and also of the, the distance and time on this kind of thing with Mary Lou Henner. Mary Lou is one of the uh, uh, people actually in our study. And can you cue this video up here? It didn't automatically start. We searched for footage of long ago events in Mary Lou's life to try and stump her. October 26th, 1976. Okay, October 26th, 1976. Was a Tuesday. Oh, I went to uh, went to shoot a ring around the college commercial in Venice, Italy, and you saw a second and a half moonshot of Venice. 
And then Gondolier is singing, up above I sing, tra la la la, for you've got ring around the ka la la. And I went, my powder didn't work. <laughs> More than 30 years later, Wow. wow, exactly. So, and you saw it took her a second, and she came up with this 30 year old memory. And that's an incredible kind of thing to be able to pull upon that sort of information. And this is exactly what a lot of people say they would love to have. They would love to be able to remember these things. I heard somebody in the audience, so when they heard it was going to be about memory, saying it's like, oh, yeah, as an actor, wouldn't it be great? Well, okay. It would be great in many ways to be able to remember lots of this information. But there are other sides to this kind of thing as well. So quick show of hands here. How many people think that they would want to have this sort of memory? And how many people, no? OK, it's about evenly split. So a nice visual for that sort of thing as well. Because you have to think that, okay, look, you're going to be remembering all the good stuff, but you're also going to be remembering all of the bad stuff. And you also start to think, why is it that our memory is the way it is? Why is it that we forget? You know, we evolved this memory system, and it's not the absolute pinnacle. We are not the pinnacle of evolution, but it has evolved to be adaptive, and maybe there's a reason why we actually forget. And we can get a little bit of insight, actually, from the very first contact we ever had with one of these participants sent an email to one of the people in, uh, in our group, Jim McGaw, and the very first line of this very first contact said this. This is Jill Price. She wrote a book called The Woman Who Can't Forget. And she starts the email off saying, I have a problem. I have a problem. It's the very first line. My problem is that I remember every day everything said to me, every place I went, every book I've read, every face I've seen, everything that I've done since I was 13 years old. My memory before 13 is fragmented at best. However, everything afterwards seems to be burned into my brain, whether I like it or not, with shockingly true to life clarity. Now, we've seen it's not actually quite as good as she portrays it here, but it's really, really close. And she does remember these. And yet her initial statement was, I have a problem. Because we can think of these kinds of memories as it, and it would be great. I have had so many times in which I know I know this person. Where do I know this person from? What's this person's name? They seem to know who I am. How am I going to get through this conversation? Oh, yeah, good to see you again. Oh, we've never met. Oh, oops. Okay. It does seem like it would be a great kind of thing. But there are plenty of times in which we know having a very, very good memory is actually a problem. And that forgetting is a powerful thing, and that maybe we evolved to be able to forget for good reasons. I mean, PTSD is really the, the poster child for this. You have a traumatic event, and you cannot get rid of that. It goes, stays in your head, repeats over and over again of this horrible traumatic event. It leads to a huge disruption, obviously, of your life and the life of uh, those around you. But PTSD isn't the only one. When we think about drug addiction, we call it a drug habit for a reason. Habits are memories. You see things like these cues of the drug, or the drug itself, and it leads to the memory of this, which leads to the drug-seeking behavior, the relapse, etc. It's a lot like Pavlov and his dog. There's a huge memory component to it. In depression, rumination, having again these thoughts going through your head that you cannot get rid of, it's a habitual thing. Everything keeps triggering it. It has a lot of things in common there with PTSD. And then finally here, obsessive compulsive disorder. You know on the one hand that actually you've turned those lights off, that you've taken care of this, but there's this habit, this memory that is compelling you to do it regardless of that fact. And we see links actually between this highly superior autobiographical memory and there are aspects of this as well. In fact, there's a, a real link in some way, shape, or form with obsessive kinds of tendencies. I'm not here to say that, yes, in fact, they are OCD and it's the same sort of thing. Don't, don't have that as a take home, but I want to show you one more video clip. This is Mary Lou Henner, who is exceptionally organized, showing you what her closet is like. 
Exhibit A is Mary Lou Henner's closet. I love organization. I like my shoes a certain way, right foot going this way, left foot going that way, so you can always see the toe and the heel on every pair. And you'll see that things are very color coordinated here, but in sections. And I always hang like with like, and I have the exact same hangers, because then everything slides more easily. OK, that's an exceptional level of organization. And we see that there are obsessive tendencies that run throughout this. As I say, it's not that if you have OCD, you are HSAM, or if you're HSAM, you're OCD, or any of these things. However, there is something about having this very, very strong memory, having these clear habits and being compelled to do things. If you are compelled to hold on to your personal narrative and you think about what happened every day and you do this every day for days, weeks, months, years, decades, it's going to lead to an incredibly good memory for those events. And this is the kind of thing that right now our lab is trying to actually unpack and, uh, and figure out. But I want to leave you, though, with this notion as to what memory is for and what it's about and why we have it. This should not be your image of memory. It shouldn't be for looking back so that when we're old, we can say, yeah, I remember when. That's not what it's there for. Memory is for the here and now and for making the choices that will guide us through our lives. It's so that our past experiences can let us actually be more adaptive right now. We evolved memory so that we can be adaptive in the here and now, so that our past can guide us. And part of that guiding is actually forgetting as well. You know, if you take our sort of classic view of our ancestors here, they're sharing information, they're sharing stories. They're actually trying to take bits and pieces from perhaps even fact different events and tie it together into a story, into a parable, into some wisdom that they have extracted as a person, as a community. And that's what memory is actually here for. You know, Rodin called this statue the thinker. Google Image calls this guy who forgot something. But if you look at them, there are some similarities here to the point at which I'm not sure whether Rodin is thinking or whether, whether his statue here is thinking or whether he's forgetting. But my real point here is that, as Borges said, to think is to forget a difference, to generalize and to abstract. So that, yeah, he's the thinker, but he's also the forgetter. Because that's actually where knowledge and wisdom comes from, from abstracting across all of the trivial little details and bits, pulling out the core deep pulling out the core essence that we should be remembering and holding on to. So if you want to come up to me and say, well, after I tell you that I'm a memory researcher, you can say, oh, you should study me. I'm forgetting things all the time. Great. Leave off that last little bit about it being horrible, because your memory isn't horrible. It's adaptive. And it's a good thing sometimes to forget. Thank you very much. Thank you.